Okay, so for our first session tonight, we have Stein and Priscilla Haring Kuipers. I hope I pronounced it more or less correctly. Uh, they are together running a company called This Is Not Rocket Science, as we already mentioned a bit earlier. And This Is Not Rocket Science actually is making hardware, as we can already see in a second. So Stein and Priscilla, hello. Thank you very much for being on the show. Please tell us a little bit about yourselves and uh, what you do and what is this yeah. hardware is all about. Well, uh, this is not rocket science. Oh, well, it comes well, from the idea that everything is easy once you know how to do it. Um, and that is usually our approach to things. You know, do your homework, figure things out, but then just get to doing it, which is a very much hardware thing. Reality is the biggest check of if you got everything or not, because it is brutal. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, we, yeah, we, we've had a particularly rough manufacturing day today, so our minds are still a bit blah. Um, this is the rocket science. We, we try and make things that are easy. To, well, it's, it's, it's sort of not easy to learn, hard to master, that, that kind of stuff. It tries to get out of your way. So whatever you're doing, it's not actually that difficult. You want to make people feel good. You want to make things sound nice. Um, we don't try to make tools that try to be important by themselves they should enable somebody to achieve a goal and if, if that means we have to go all out uh, rainbow puke um to make the, to make people sort of feel that it's not so serious and they're allowed to touch it and things are core grouping or whatever then we'll just go all out rainbow puke um where other manufacturers might choose black for, because it's the same core or whatever. But I think uh, nobody feels helped by black and we try to make things that people want to use. So that, that's uh, that another, another core part of why it isn't rocket science. And you've been programming. I've been programming in general since uh, I think I started, I, I wanted to be a programmer since I was three years old. I didn't become a programmer until I was about 10. Um, and then one of the first things I tried to do was get a computer to make sound. I mean, the first day the computer came into our house, I was sleeping with the programming manual under my pillow and trying to figure out how to get this thing to go beat. Um, and then by the time I was a bit older and I really wanted to make house music, which was then the thing you, you got on a, on a cassette tape, a bootleg tape from somewhere. I was completely en 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 enchanted by it. Um, so I went into the studio store with my saved up pocket money uh, only to find out that you needed a substantial investment of gear before you could make anything decent. So I went home and I did the proverbial back of the envelope calculation uh, to see if the computer I had at home could theoretically do it. And it turned out it could. And so I, I had to learn how to program well enough to get the beeps out. And then a few decades later, I'm here. In between it's, have been a lot of yeah. plugins. Lots of plugins. Soft synths. I, I started out in Tracker Land, like Fast Tracker and, uh, and, and earlier. Uh, and then a lot of Jeskula Buzz. I, I think I did about 70 plugins for Jeskula Buzz. I did a bunch of VST plugins. I made a complete software modular synthesizer for educational use and then another version of it for uh, more studio use. Um, then I did a lot of game audio engines. Uh, I taught game audio engine design at media technology school and audio design in general. So I've been all over the place. And in between that, I have been employed as a freelance inventor to actually make enough money to afford my audio uh, dreams. So that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's been a rocky road. But since, since a few years, we've gone full time uh, this is the rocket science. This is now the only thing we're we're still doing. Um, we started out small because uh, after all these years of audio development, of course, the software bit was well. It's still not easy, but it's trivial compared to everything else. So we, um, I found out that for about a euro worth of chips, you can have uh, something that can run a mono synth. So I said, well, I just buy the chip, I put it on a board, I learn how to program that. Uh, I have the code from some ancient Pocket PC plugin I wrote, I just copy paste it in. And um, yeah, that, that, that seemed feasible as a roll in. So we uh, designed a tiny synthesizer box 
and we took this box to Shenzhen to figure out, okay, we, we know if you want to make hardware, you produce this in China, but we have no clue where, where this process goes or where this, uh, how, how to go about it. Can we it. do this? Can we do this? And um, we wanted to step into this with an actual, or at least actual enough uh, product to make. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, that's where we started. This is not rocket science. My background is absolutely not in programming or DSP, but in uh, marketing, social sciences, media psychology. So the only programming I know is the statistical packages uh, to do uh, the analysis of experiments with, um, which is not what we're doing anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> But it made a very good team to uh, hold a company. And it also means that we, I guess by my social background, um, constantly are asking ourselves also more the philosophical and social questions. Why do we do this? What do we want to experience? What do we want other people to experience? How do we facilitate? And you just said like, we, we don't want the, things and instruments to be in your way we want the you know, you know the best ux is the ux you can't see that you forget but we do have opinions obviously about color as you can see here um about playfulness about openness uh, uh everything we do is open source um the whole this is not rocket science thing is usually also a collaboration so there's another designer behind this uh which is not in our company but works with us there are for other modules there are other designers behind it that work for with us on that project um yeah so that's the this is not rocket science part and look it up online this is not rocket science dot nl because hey we're dutch so you know um and there's a lot of dev blogs that were just rambling on how how does everything go with production this week we try to be very open about everything not so much as a shining example but more as as information of, yeah you know this here is, be dragons warning <laughs> this is what might happen this explode. might be a good idea this might not be a good idea yeah no. but we so we went to china with our simple box which turned out to be kind of a complicated box so uh came back home simplified stuff go to the uh, literal minimum viable product like where do we feel that we know enough about software that it makes sense to put it in a hardware box without making the hardware too difficult? Um, and the first thing we, we did, which also fits the rest of the, uh, the design philosophy of the, of the thing, was a procedural melody generator. Because if you're, if you're any familiar with these massive boxes of synthesizers, if you are live on stage and well, you're there, there's a crowd in front of you, they're waiting, you have a beat going maybe, um, just having a something safe to just plug back in. Just, I don't know what to do. Let's give it a procedural melody that that's sort of in the right vibe, and it will just do the thing while I set up the next sound. Um, so we we looked at a whole bunch of procedural melody generation, and we lo looked at things like Markov chains and deep learning, and uh, eventually, we, I, I think I found. Our Huru's old psycho uh, sort of window standalone melody generator things. Um, in the end, we just sat down with a clipboard and just said, well, this bass line, if, if a note goes up, let's make a thing go up. If I make a checkbox go up, goes down two notes later, got a whole statistical grid of all the standard musical styles that were there, made a statistical generator that, that could actually make the same style happen again, and put it on a tiny chip. And then we just designed the whole product range from for uh, our first hardware release around that. So the, the, the code for that was pr very pragmatic, very simple. There is no memory in the chip. It's had four kilobytes of RAM total, uh, 24 kilobytes of flash space for your entire program, which includes all the drivers and the bootloaders and everything else. Um, so a, a very simple, tiny bunch of algorithms worth having, and we grew our first product around this and then you um i'm not sure how familiar people are with with the development of, of circuit boards you you it's uh it's, yeah it's like a 2d graphics package you just you have a whole bunch of components and you draw lines between the components where you want them connected until uh at some point yeah, i can close up this is a 
more recent design, but yeah. It's a very simple one. This is a fairly simple design. Um, but then, then you get into the cycle, this like building software, uh, instead of uh, the build cycle with hardware is you press go, and then you send out a whole bunch of files to a whole flock of different factories. And uh, maybe two weeks later, you, you start having enough components to, to manually assemble one prototype, which can take, well, initially it took about a week to assemble a prototype. These days, it's sort of uh, one, one hand, you, you solder one prototype, with the other hand, you're making soup. And we, we're getting faster there. <laughs> hey. um, but this, this whole, it, the, the design iteration speed of your, you, you think of something, you, you, you design the thing, you press go, and two or three weeks later, you see, well, no, this is not what I meant. <laughs> so you just <laughs> throw it away again, you start drawing again, you wait another three weeks, and then uh, you, know, you have your second version in, uh, in hand. And that this, it, this, again, uh, as a contrast to programming, these iterations are not free. So some of these prototypes, depending on what you're doing, are uh, rather expensive. So this, this pressing go becomes like, do I really dare to press the button now? Because <laughs> if, I, if I get it wrong, it's, it's yet another expense. So part also time, also time, time and expenses, um, and also waste of material and uh, logistics and everything involved because there, there's so much stuff being put in motion by the time you're actually pressing go. Mm -hmm. um, the first uh, thing that you mentioned before, our procedural sequence, that's called Tuesday. Yeah. But these being Tuesday. No, there's no these being Tuesday. No, not, no. not yet. We're getting there. We're, we're getting, getting there. there. <laughs> because we're still ramping up. I mean, before you can actually do anything sensible, you have to have all your building bricks in place before you can have a complicated enough thing together that actually works, that you can sort of be creative with it because the technology has become trivial. So we're still building towards a level of triviality that, that we can go back to designing a thing that's worth having. Um, and in the initial, the Tuesday procedural sequencer, the yeah, the, the building of the mouse is okay. not sure. Um, maybe open question. Can that be co considered DSP or is that that's what? There's no signal flowing through. There's just a, a pattern being generated. It's not a signal, the pattern. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Edge case. Um, what do you, what do you <laughs> think? Is this signal it's process? Edge case. It's an edge case to me. Yeah. DSP or not? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just too, too low speed. Okay. Um, but by the time we got this trick ready, like we have the whole pipeline set up, we have all the factories mapped out, we, we are now quite comfortable with pressing pressing the order button. Um, that was the first time that business rocket science could really say, well, now we're going to step take one step back and see how we can finally apply our thoughts on things. Um, and now we're also coming to going more to the core of why we're here, Ethan, and what what uh, was what, what already earlier discussed with Joshua. Um, the uh, the reason why you want to give why you build a DSP system is usually that you want to enable somebody to do something cool that you would probably personally like to experience while you're on the dance floor. Right? I want to make the ultimate knob that somebody will drop that beat with that I will go completely apeshit when I see somebody do that. And a lot of the, uh, the, the, the DSP stuff that I see is more focused on how can we get this sawtooth perfectly band limited. And when I'm on the dance floor, I don't give a shit. So <laughs> how can we make a control where I enable that thing that I want to happen all the way at, at the consumer end of, of the process. So uh, like with the Tuesday, I want that modular live performer to have something to fall back on so, so the vibe is not gone. So uh, what, what can I help them with? Well, I can give them melodies that are always good within a certain style and I can just press the button and, and forget about this or rely on it even. Um, and same, same with like an oscillator, you can say, well, I can make a perfect sawtooth and it will be 
exquisite in its in its edginess and it will sound pure all the way up to bats fly, falling out of the sky but if i'm going to do uh, the, the research into what sawtooth people would actually like on a dance floor they would do something completely different um one no for instance the, the classic example of this is of course the 303 sawtooth one of the most popular ones ever made if you look at it on an oscilloscope, it isn't. It it really isn't. It's some sort of shark tooth with with ringing edges and and, and, a, and a filter that craps out. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> completely different different goal. So as soon as you start from the goal and work backwards, you say, well, okay. Apparently, I need this completely wobbly thing that makes my my hairs go up. How about I just put my hairs up first and reason backwards? So it's. Um, <laughs> From, from that perspective, we started, uh, well, not with an oscillator, that, that's a whole different story. There's, there's a bunch of cool stuff in the Phoenix that we have here that we'll talk about later. Um, yeah, the I, no, the wobbler, the wobbler. Oh, okay. I have here um, the wobbler, it's actually uh, world primer. This is the wobbler two already, uh, but the wobbler is an LFO that does what I want an LFO to do, and that um, in this case, why usually you have a piece of music and you think this is boring, so I want an LFO. This is maybe a weird, <laughs> a weird um, approach, but usually you have some sort of uh, you you are too lazy to draw an automation track. Is is maybe a better conclusion. So instead of drawing an automation track, I'm going to enable something that does this for me, that will do it interestingly enough, so I don't have to. And um, if you then go the, uh, one step further, like I would actually want to, to draw this automation track, but I would like to copy me, <laughs> another copy, and say, well, me, can you make my ideal automation track for me? Um, oh, I couldn't, of course. And, uh, I had not. I didn't have enough memory inside these devices to make a, any decent attempt at a copy of myself. So then we start asking, well, what would I ask a potential band member to do for me? Like St Steve, the operator of the cutoff knob. Uh, Steve, can you wobble it slightly for me? You know that way that I like. And then, um, I, I started sort of pulling apart the exact vocabulary I might want to use to convince Steve to do the right thing for me. And then because you're live on stage and music is loud, you can barely talk to each other. You may sort of end up with three hand signals, faster, slower, you know, a bit more that way and, and, and something like that. And um, these hand wavings have now been converted into tr three knobs on this device. We have the speed, of course, well, four knobs actually. Um, the speed, well, okay. Uh, we have a, a shape knob, which is a bit ominous because there's, it doesn't have the usual shapes. It's, uh, it has a phase knob because sometimes we change the timing a bit and it has a, has a modification knob. Um, but all of these are a completely gradual field of modulations that are non stepped So uh, where in some, some systems you might select between I want a triangle LFO, or I want a saw LFO, or a sine LFO. Uh, everything here is a smooth interpolation between everything. So you can have a sine, and it goes slightly more triangle-ish, and a triangle goes slightly more saw-ish, and then the saw, saw morphs into a, um, into a pulse, and, all the, and, and back. Um, but that's only the first shape. That's sort of a modification of first shape. Because from there, if I would ask myself to control this knob, I would not do a sine wave. That's boring. You do something else. You, just, just <laughs> you want to dance with this knob. You don't want to do the regular thing. Because that's, um, so if, if I could ask, uh, you, it sounds like you've put a lot of you know your personal judgment and uh, you know your your feeling of, of grooviness into this into yeah. this object. You said that also a lot of this is open source. Yes. Like how much of these decisions you've made, which are kind of capturing a lot of the personality of, of your product, end up being uh, public? 
All of them. All of them. Did you feel any uh, any awkwardness or pressure around that? Because I've I've heard from people who make hardware that I actually I went to a talk by someone who made a little JavaScript board, and they said that they could sell the hardware, and that was fine. Yeah. But they tried to keep the the software closed source, and they got literal hate mail. So like people really expect this kind of op they expect to be able to open source everything. So I was kind of no. wondering if that's something that you encountered, or whether that's like well, you just a lot of families anyway. No, everything we do is open, well, for two, more, more, than, more than one reason. Yeah, you have a very morbid one. Yeah, the morbid one, but um, also the nice one. The, ni <laughs> the nice one is more the, the philosophy of learning, which is um, very, very important to both of us. And is you are have no, barely any formal education. So what you know, you know from the internet and the kindness and openness of others. So how can we then now not share and do the same. And again, it is not to be a shining example of this is how you do it, but it's just, this is how we did it. And if this is helpful to you, then awesome. Yeah. And there are now uh, a, a couple, I don't know, is it a couple hundred? Uh, the Tuesday, Choose the NMI group? Choose the NMI Facebook group. So there are uh, a bunch of people who are making not just the Tuesday, the Wobbler, other modules that we've made too. So all the um, hardware itself is also on GitHub and the software and everything. So people are downloading it themselves. They send it to the factories themselves and yeah. they flash them themselves and they so we, build we them don't and learn. So we don't sell kits. We sell like completely finished and ten tested products that we mm. understand, okay, this is what we're shipping out and we can fully stand behind that. And uh, but they build their own version of it just by the, um, the, the schematics and everything except for the graphics. That's the only thing that we keep to ourselves is the exact front. So that there also shouldn't be any um, uh, misunderstanding on who made this thing. And mostly this, this goes perfectly fine. Like people make their own version, they make their own graphics on it. It's, it's an exploration of them of how to build this. Uh, people make their own adaptations, which is nice. But we now have, for the first time, also somebody who has made kits out of uh, our, uh, our designs our designs and schematics and designed his own fronts for it. And the store who's going to be selling those emailed us first and saying, are you, are you really okay with this? <laughs> this guy told us that you're fine with this, but are you really okay with this? And we said, yeah, as long as it's clear that our name we, is not uh, on it. We don't support. We don't it. support any of this. If it explodes, that's your problem. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, and yeah. That's fine, but I don't. The other way around, I have never felt pressured to be open source because in modular, a lot of it is not. So yeah. it's quite common to not be this open. Right. And I, I have a, a the, the morbid reason. I don't, I don't think it's actually that morbid. Um, <laughs> But we, we try and make these things to be not throwaway ever. So like any musical instrument, uh, nobody has ever recycled a Stradivarius as, a, as an extreme example. But if I, don't, if I close the source for this and the chip melts and 50 years from now, that chip is not available, but another chip is, then I have no problem with somebody compiling the same source code for whatever ARM 128 bits exists by then and keep it alive. And if I, if it's closed source, it's just dead. So just just from a longevity standpoint, I think we have to be open source. We have an issue with the big thing because that on, on not all of it on the inside is ours, and unfortunately, therefore, it cannot be completely open source. Otherwise, it would, but we we don't like have the have the rights to all the schematics in there. Um, so we can't, but this, this, another morbid, this person who's a bit older than us has promised to give us those rights, like in his, uh, last will and no. testament. <laughs> so as soon as he, yeah. the whole thing will be open source. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I, I hope that answered that. <laughs> so we, we, we have another question. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we have another question, which is uh, from Once I Had a Cat, and they ask, are you building all the modules all alone? How do you deal with the stress level? Uh, <laughs> there was a person from Orthonic, 
were orthogonal <laughs> devices who talked about the stress levels uh, due to the high demand. Oh, yeah, yeah, demand we, we don't care so much about. Well, you don't care, I talk to Yeah, you, you talk to the customer, <laughs> I don't talk to the people, yeah. Um, we like we like the high demand. Yeah, we make what we make and it sells out, it's okay. We don't feel pressured into doing more production runs, we just then don't we feel can. like it. No. So that's, uh, we build what we can build. Uh, with the current product, we've been developing this thing for three years full time with, uh, yeah, you, you and me full time pretty much, and, and an extra developer, uh, Laudi, uh, also, also part -time. full time, yeah, lately full time. Full -time. Yeah. Sometimes part -time. Um, but we, we've really gotten into the uh, to the point where we're it should have been done by now, but but the amount of setbacks we've had has sort of pushed it on and on and on, and we, we've only been able to deliver the first 25 so far out of the 100 we intend to make. That, that stress level, yeah, but it's more the stress of not being allowed to be creative because you're bound by the product that you've designed literally years ago, and we're still making it. I want to do something else now, but it's, yeah. So the, uh, the stress for the production, less so, but the creative limitations more. No, I'm so, just I, I, we feel the stress of the production as well. Like we, when we said before, when we started uh, uh, the stream, today is actually a really hard day um, manufacturing wise as we had some more setbacks and all, like the thing where you expect, okay, we're, we're good now. All the electronics for all the rest of the hundreds are all, and they're all in our house. Tested, yeah, fine. Tested, it's all fantastic. So the complicated part is done. And now we have having issue upon issue with the aluminum cases that they go in. And we've now, we cannot produce any further because of our case manufacturer. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so there's ah. always such a focus on the difficult bit that the easy bit turns out to be the biggest problem. That bites you in the That's in may, maybe but it's the universal also, rule of engineering that the easy thing turns out to be, yeah. <laughs> like the, the simple questions are always the hardest to answer. So how do we deal with the stress? Uh, how, do you, how does anyone deal with stress? Um, for me lately, I've been really hanging on to uh, uh, some time away that we've planned when this, this should be done. Uh, but what really helps is to share this with people because thankfully um, we have some very enthusiastic customers and what they make with it is, is often something we really like. And this, you know, you're building stuff for music. It's not hard to be happy about this and you're making other people happy with it. So that and connecting back to that when it's really difficult, that really helps. Yeah. So, yay. And any other open questions? Or, is um, it, or shall I finish the story of the <clears throat> note? Because there, there, there's more to it. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to say, just going back to what you were saying about the LFO and your, and your thought process, your creative process around that. Do you think that the industry needs more of that in terms of creative approaches, approaches that are breaking the norm, approaches that are making a statement rather than um, well, yes, all it's, too it's, square. Um, because these days, te technically, or, uh, the technology to do practically everything is almost free. I, uh, I've made a point of it for, well, we, we make music as well. Of course, we, we make instruments, but we make it because we, want, we like to make music. Um, and every year for New Year's Eve, we make a countdown track for a trance party. That's, uh, if, yeah, I, I always forget to make music, but the countdown track is sort of the staple that has to happen. But for the past few years, I've made a point of it to just go dumpster diving and grab a PC from the trash and make the track for that, just to show that it can be done. Using freeware and a free computer, just go. And so technology, te technology is practically free. Uh, the algorithms to do practically everything are also free. So now we get into the point of the theater design of putting a musician into a good vibe and in a, an interesting surrounding to perform best. So yet another thing that tries to simulate the hardware look of a Jupiter 80 or whatever. Eh, that's the, or, or yeah, let, let's not talk about the cloning or just uh, uh, everybody trying to imitate the hardware. Just, give me an interesting musical interaction 
with a system that takes me places where I didn't expect to go, that, that seems to be much more uh, rewarding than enabling people to do exactly what's already been done, but now with a different skin on it. So um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if that's a norm breaking. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> But it, it's it's enabling people to to confront themselves in different ways. If uh, if, if that makes sense, and maybe yeah, to, absolutely to surprise other people in different ways. Because uh, yeah, to, to to finish the the, the one no. Because if, if there's one topic I want to have this kind of, <laughs> it is what one one, uh, one storyline. Um, there there's of course the classic knob that goes to eleven from the Spinal Tap, and of course. Uh, I'm, I'm highly convinced that every knob should go to 11, preferably also to I and minus one, if you can afford to. But it does mean that you have to sort of look at anything and say, well, what does it actually mean to go slightly further than what, what my usual numerical maximum is? Like um, a lot of knobs are pure in a sense, in that they control one thing. But if you have like uh, a cutoff knob and you open it up, and the low pass filter is entirely open, that also you can also just go a bit further and do a high boost to just add something completely new in, um, just, just to add that extra kick to get the last 10% of range, give it something interesting. So that, um, for, for this LFO, we, we made the shape, uh, no, I'm holding it again, in the middle there's those five LED, LEDs around the tiny knob, uh, around here. Those are all the, the shapes and they, they tell a tiny story and they go from simple to complex to even more complex to chaotic to noise and then beyond noise, they, they go into structured noise. But there is this, uh, you ask some, somebody to do a regular thing and then yes, it's regular, but can you now do a slightly more complicated regular thing? Um, and then it goes into a physical model of what the twang is. Like if you have a, a stick on the edge of a tail, you go, which is also a perfectly valid LFO, just to give it a kick and then it starts twanging. Um, and of course, if you can have a twang, you can also have an inverted twang. So there's the modification of where you can make it inverted. So you go and the, the other way around. Uh, and beyond that, it goes into double pendulum, which is the same as a twang, except now it can become chaotic and you get an amount of chaos tweaking so you can uh, decide how unpredictable you want it to be. And then beyond that, you get a classic sample and hold noise LFO and, and then quantize that again. So you have this whole storyline in one knob, which is again, what I said with the hand signs towards Steve, like, can you make it slightly more chaotic? Can you or maybe, maybe hold it down a bit? And th this one knob gives you the entire well, spectrum of kinds of things that I would expect him to do for me. So that's um, that's pretty much the the way we try to design all our knobs if we have the luxury of spending the time on it because the, uh, for this particular module, we had the hardware done. It was just sitting in a box, all the modules packaged ready, except the firmware. And it was like, uh, uh, I think we spent half a year of refining it and tweaking the storyline so it really made sense before I finally flashed the final firmware on them and sent them out. So, okay, this is good, now it can go. <laughs> but it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it has been worth it. As in, I've, I've now been playing it with it for years and I still haven't really wanted to ask this thing anything else yet. Except for when we, are now releasing version two, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> I have another question. So is there, have you ever thought about just going back to software, make, remaking these in, in plugins or as their own standalone audio applications? Have you ever thought about that? And what would the challenges be to actually creating that? Uh, well, it, no challenge at all, because I simulate this all as software already. Um, and my, my primary background is software, de decades of, of writing, writing stuff. Uh, I'm not looking forward to testing everywhere again, because that at some point, uh, I think I stopped releasing plugins when there was this explosion in all the different SIMD architectures 
where SSZ2, SSZ3, SSZ4, SSZ4.2, there, there was just no more single target to optimize for and it would just be fine. Suddenly there was this gigantic mess of targets that all had to work equally well or you get uh, CPU wars on the forums. Um, so a lot of this, we could just do a software, but an LFO as a plugin doesn't really make sense right now. Um, I do have pl uh, pl plugins for uh, stuff like our synthesizer voice work. Um, and I have the modular synthesizer plugins that we are going to revisit. And that's maybe uh, yeah, big announcement that we are after this thing is done, I'll, I'll be working on a keyboard like uh, since as a keyboard and inside this keyboard, uh, we put a modular synthesizer, but a polyphonic software modular synthesizer uh, and an HDMI out. So you just have, have a big screen and a mouse and, uh, and a keyboard attached. I could just edit the thing without having an operating system or ha having a remote plugin. But the development environment for this is going to be on the thing and on PC. And that is all, uh, also going to be all open source. So we are going back into software mode on our own hardware platform, but yeah. it's supported by the big, uh, yeah, the, the, also the, the, the PC version. To skate around the fact that otherwise you don't know what you're programming for or to, so you can't optimize. It. Yeah, so then we have one big optimization target. And if somebody else wants to optimize it for something else, then of course they can. Uh, but hopefully they'll just want to be on our hardware platform too. So, but that's years away. I actually also have a question, if I may. So yeah. it's not directly about your product, actually, but it's more like about this theme of learning and sharing that you kind of mentioned before. Let's say I am a software developer who knows DSP, knows how to program in C and C++, knows how to make a software plugin. But now I'm curious about making hardware. You know, I'm, I've never done this before, but I'm curious about how to, you know, how to develop a piece of hardware. Do you have any advice how to get into this world, basically? What, oh, right. where to look, what we, where to start learning about like embedded and, you know, well, things the, like the, that? The simple thing these days, uh, well, there's a bunch of amazing microcontrollers available for very little money. Like a Teensy is a very nice one. Uh, Teensy 4 is, is powerful enough that you have uh, a lot of CPU power to run your usual synthesis algorithms or effect algorithms. Um, and there, there are some audio boards available. You have this, uh, I, have, I have a tiny board here. This, this looks almost like it. This is our own thing. So just a board like this with a big USB plug. You can just plug it in and then you stick it on a tiny audio daughter board and you can just start, uh, get started. Maybe you, you can set it up in like 10 minutes these days and open an audio example and have it running. And it, uh, yeah, and, and, and you go. Um, I think if you're like completely unfamiliar with electronics, get some kits Start, and get out of, out of the idea that this is this uh, that you are not allowed to break things, that this is somehow very very difficult, that this is done by people in clean rooms and white coats because it is most definitely not. And all the hardware in your life has an amazing amount of hands on. Even Apple, how it produces stuff, still goes through a lot of mostly Chinese female hands uh, in, its, in its production process. So this could be your hands too. And if you screw something up, well, either uh, order a new one or desolder it and, and resolder something new on it. So the, I think my biggest advice would be- um, Burn your find, fingers. Yeah, burn your fingers. <laughs> find, find something. And usually these things start with make a lead blink. That yeah, also, is the first step into electronics um, usually is to make something I mean, we have, fun to you. We have barely touched our show and tell stuff here. Uh, <laughs> recently, uh, Raspberry... It's supposed to talk about DSP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, recently, Raspberry has released their new RP2040 chip. Um, yes. And, and they have a tiny board based on the chip, the, the Pico, the Raspberry Pico. That's four dollars. So It is amazing. The documentation around it is yeah. fantastic. We expect the whole, what, how do you say that, ecology around this to, to grow and to be awesome. But most so importantly, it's fast enough. It, it doesn't have a floating point unit, so you need to be either conservative in your floating point usage because it will be emulated. It will work, it will just be slow, or you can do a fixed point DSP and it will just blaze, uh, go blazing fast. 
It's a dual core uh, 48, uh, no, dual core 130 megahertz chip for 50 cents, four dollars for the board. So you can, uh, yeah. In this case, uh, I made a 16 voice polysynth on one of those chips. Just it runs. So for four dollars, you can get started in in your own hardware development and run some code on there. And there's amazing tutorials on their site on how to actually connect this up and have a debugger running. If you're familiar with GDB, it's, it's all there. Visual Studio Code and GDB and C++. If, you, if you're if you already familiar with those, you can do this. Amazing. Um, going back to what you were saying about the teen seat, did, did you have a particular model in mind? Uh, somebody was asking on, on the um, chat. The four uh, is where the, the, the hardware starts being seriously beefy. Um, but the three, 3 3.2 is, is what you're more commonly, uh, what you can more commonly get in microcontrollers because for the, if you want to make your own board later, not with a TNC and you need, you want to just put your own chip on, on a PCB, then um, the, the technology that's in the four is a bit much more difficult to hand solar. So then, it, it, Initially, if you want to have easy prototyping, take a four, but if you want to develop for something mass marketed, maybe go for 3.2 or for a Pico. So that's great. And where, where can people find your, uh, the source code? So you were saying your code is open source. Where, uh, where will people on, on find GitHub, that? GitHub, GitHub, and rocket science. Uh, yeah. it's, it's also on this rocket science.nl. There's a GitHub link somewhere. Right, and I'll put up. I'll put the video I'll I'll put the link in the description as well. Um, uh, for people that are interested, a lot of our source code is not just this. Uh, we also make all the manufacturing tools uh, available, like uh, this this factory panel that I have here. Well, there's a whole bunch of graphics on there, uh, but this this panel is automatically generated from a single. PCB file and then it, it combines it into, into five and it makes a frame around it and labels it all correctly. So stuff like that is uh, the whole interface, how we deal with factories, we also share. And all our factory tools go into repository and uh, other people can, can use those too. Because yeah, for the for things like the big one here, um, maybe maybe it's finally time to get a bit closer to the camera. Yeah. Ah. Uh, can we put it somewhere? Here? Here, yes. Uh, okay. and, and module, yay. So many things, here's an ending. So, do I still fit in the frame somewhere? No. No. Uh, here. Ah. So, <laughs> this is the Phoenix 4. We have been, uh, sp we spent about three years uh, developing this thing. To make something this big is actually um, kind of a challenge for most design software because this, you have to have a PCB that is this size to actually get it together. And there's, there's about four and a half thousand components um, in one of these. And most of these design software uh, suites are not created for anything of this scale. So that just frame rate goes to one and you can't, you sort of have to stop designing because it doesn't work. Um, so a big part of our process to make this thing was to make the build pipeline to actually combine all these things together and then, uh, yeah, merge this into one monster design and then split the monster design back into individual mini pieces that actually fit into the assembly robots because maybe you can see there, there are some cutting lines where, where, uh, where the boards split up because that, that's the maximum size that the, one of the assembly robots will take. Um, so the whole build pipeline to make small designs, combine them into a bigger design, then split them up again into designs that can be done by manufacturing robots, then uh, slicing off the design so we can actually uh, procedurally generate all the graphics on here. So all the graphics on here are automatically generated as vector graphics from the circuit board directly. So we have some annotated knobs, like this knob says cutoff. So please add the label cutoff and, and the nice gradation around it where the circuit board actually is. So that's, uh, we, 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 we try and build this entire pipeline in a way that, that, uh, that we can do this because otherwise this would be way too big for me to design. I mean, 
I, I may be handy with design software. I'm not that handy. So anytime I can offload anything to the computer for me, we build a script and we try to replace that bit of me with, with that. Like you replace yourself twiddling the knob. Yeah, just like I replace myself twiddling the knob, I also replace myself designing circuit boards if I can. So just, just every, anytime I can be lazy, <laughs> I'll spend a lot of time trying to become more lazy. As programmers. It's just, but as general programmer, yes. It's, but yeah, and, um, maybe just this is fantastic. I think uh, I think our audience. I don't see any other questions from our audience. Um, is there anything else that you that you would like to share with us? Um, so so once again, can you just give us the website? And I'll put the I'll put the website in the chat as well. So is it is it uh, it's tinrs.nl right? No, uh, no, the full full, uh, full name. This is not rocket science.nl. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we have more, of course, uh, tons, tons more. There, there's another one, one massive pet peeve I need to mention. <laughs> Can we finally be done with ADSRs? <laughs> <laughs> what what, what do is you it say? that you don't what like do about that? ADSRs? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> everybody bites. Um, it's it's a very it was a very useful abstraction at the at the point where electronics were barely able to do anything, and these days it feels like such a crutch because you're if you're you're playing an instrument yourself you're playing a violin or you're playing playing a piano or you do whatever trumpet and vocals you uh, you don't have ADSR you usually you try to achieve something like the, maybe a certain loudness so you go there ha. And then it, you overshoot, which you get into the decay, and then you try to hold on, which is your sustain, and, ah, and then you run out of breath and you cut down. But during the process, your, all your overcompensations and all your interactions with your plan are much more detailed than an ADSR will ever give you. It's way too perfect. But these days, we can do, do more, in, like, even if you have something like a spring follower that just like a, an undampened spring, which would sort of get, get you the ripple on everything. It will give you a more natural envelope than an ADSR because you have you're, you're asking your synthesizer to perform something for you. Again, you're asking yourself playing trumpet to play this trumpet note for you. And uh, depending on the skill level of you, <laughs> you're you're going to hit that volume in in one go, perfect, no decay, or you're you're a bit wobbly and you're making it work anyway, or you never reach it at all. So. And that, if I was going to be uh, redesigning my next envelope, I would try and add a skill level, like an intention and a skill level, and maybe an amount of ego, like how much of a prima donna is this envelope? Is it going to add the wobble at the end of the note because that just wants more attention? It's just, if you have to build this in a synthesizer and um, you have only a basic envelope to start with, then you, you end up having to decorate every note with your automation tracks in your, in your DAW. But you could also just make the envelope a bit more deep or more temper yeah. temperamental. Chaotic? Chaotic, no, no just, just have, give it personality. Yeah, it's interesting. Like I'm beginning to understand that like you have a whole philosophy behind your approach. Like it's not just like, a way to do like a particular thing like a you know like an lfo but it's actually like a philosophy that kind of permeates kind of all the different things you do that's really interesting thank you <laughs> so yeah yeah more chaos it's, it's, the, it's the fight between math and chaos that results in music yeah kind of go back to like performing basically go back to like the human imperfection of you know the yeah, delivery or or even an adjustable amount of perfection. What, what does yeah. it mean to go hyper-perfect? I don't know, but first you need to have this, this scale before you can go to the other side of it. Auto-tune to 11. Yeah, yeah, auto-tune also... to 11 is just monotune. That's, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's, 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 you know, did things we weren't expecting and we don't agree on whether or not we like it. Yeah. So... <laughs> but let's go there first and then determine if we like it. Just... I love it. That's awesome. So, yes. Anything? Anything else you'd like to mention, Stein, Priscilla? I don't know. Yeah, we're, we're of course we're still. I, I love uh, uh, manufacturing this thing. Uh, 
I, I advise people to look into it in the whole history. We have, haven't even had time to, to really talk about this. About the Phoenix? Yeah. Yeah, I know. And the whole history it's, of things. It's, you said that also the Tuesday is 90 USB. Yeah, well, the yeah, of course. Yeah. an envelope, so you don't want to talk about that. No, that's how I got envelopes wrong. That's, mm -hmm. that's I feel remorse. This is not how you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> we took it out of production. Um, we didn't take it out of production. We, we don't produce anymore. Exactly. That is different. Uh, in, in the case of, of a system like this, we have an analog digital hybrid uh, because, again, with digital signal processing, um, though there's a whole range of analog to digital signal processing. You can go full analog, you can go full digital, you can go fly by wire analog, where you digitally compensate for things that go wrong in the analog domain. Um, you can also do analogly digital, which is a bit of a weird one, but you can have non clocked logic performing digital operations. So <laughs> we have, in, in the Phoenix, we've pretty much used every permutation of analog and digital processing uh, that, that, that can be thought of, as far as I'm aware. That you could go. You yeah. and Audi, yeah. what you thought was interesting, important, useful. Yeah, also the, uh, that's maybe a, a different kind of optimization that might be nice to mention, that um, a lot of, well, almost everything we uh, we have on this machine could be done digitally, but for some functions it just becomes prohibitive to do it digitally, and it adds delay, uh, because this is a completely analog patch bay, and every time you have to have a buffer uh, to take in some samples and then process it and then buffer it out again, that that can add up to a millisecond if you're unlucky. Uh, most of our stuff is a bit faster than that. But still, if you have a complex patch, you can the, the milliseconds start adding up and it just becomes less interactive or less snappy. Um, so for some, some stuff like a filter, perfect digital filters exist. We have a really nice digital filter, but in terms of hardware costs, an analog filter is just cheaper. And if it does the same thing, then why don't we do the calculations analog? And um, if you go into electronics building, then if you can have any mathematical expression, you can pretty much just convert that one-to-one -one into an electronic schematic. And after a few basic pointers, you can sort of read an analog schematic as just as, as a chain of operations to a signal and some feedback paths and some, well, it, it, it looks remarkably like the mathematics for any signal processing really. But then in schematic form, and then if you just solder them to the board, they work. That's just with the magic of the internet and polestar.com, there's an online circuit simulator. You can really just design something on your screen in a simulated environment and then uh, transfer it to a circuit board and it works first go, maybe with some tweaks here and there. But it's a very uh, interactive and modern experience by now. So it's physics coming here in the UK. Yeah. ASP, analog signal processing. Yeah, I love it. Great. So I think that uh, that's that's it for this presentation. Thank you very much for your time and your perspectives. I think that that's been very eye opening for uh, for a lot of people. I think, hey. and um, yeah, really awesome. Yeah, once again, check it out. Um, check out their site. This is not rocket science. NL from Netherlands. That's where they're repping today. And they also have a GitHub as well, where all of their code is open source. And yeah, any other any other links that you'd like to uh, to plug? Uh, we we're wrap? on Instagram. Uh, also, I think it's Rocket Nut on Instagram. We're on Twitter, on Facebook. We're on, on the places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, and, and come visit us at Superbooth. We'll be at Superbooth. Yes. If you yes. Also in I'll try to, if they let me into the country, I'll try to come down for Superbooth <laughs> as well. Yay. Yes. Yeah. So. Great. Well, um, well, thank you for your time. Uh, if you wanted to get in touch with, uh, with Stein, you can find him on our audio programmer Discord. Uh, his name is not Stein on the audio programmer Discord. It's Zfod, so Z. -E yeah, it's my yeah my old uh, Just Club Buzz nickname where I released all my old older plugins on. Yeah, it says Z E P H O D. 
Uh, and you can join our audio programmer Discord on the audioprogrammer.com forward slash community. Also, if you'd like to present uh, your work, or share your work with us and uh, show other audio programmers what you're up to, uh, feel free to submit a uh, presentation for one of our meetups. And you can do that on the audioprogrammer.com forward slash submit. And uh, anything you'd like to add, Timur, before we jump into the next?